this, but we must note that other conditions were present before and will be here after COVID. These conditions are likely to be exasperated by COVID, forcing resources to be stretched far further than they were before, and understanding that priorities may need to be aligned. So how do we make those decisions? And who should, we be, who should be involved in the decision-making process when looking at our health indicators across the county? Next slide, please. Uh, just, I wanted to share just some county demographics and I wanted to share these because these are tied to social determinants um, that will probably be negatively impacted by COVID as we continue to move forward. Again, we are currently still in the midst of COVID, but we have to recognize and understand that as we begin to um, roll out of COVID, whether that happens in 2021 or beyond, that there will be a significant impact to our, not only organizations, but the in community and individuals that we serve. So I just wanted just to kind of highlight where we currently, or where we were as of 2019, as it relates to our population, our median household income, those living below the poverty, poverty level, looking at our income equality index, we're at 0.5 right now. Um, if we continue to go up, that means we have further, there's for, uh, sorry, more disparity among income among the majority and minority populations in our county. And then unfortunately, it, we could also see an impact on the unemployment as we continue to roll from 2021 to 20, I mean, 2020 to 2021. So I just really wanted to kind of set the stage for the indicators, the demographics and some health issues that again, are currently being exasperated by COVID. And as COVID continues and we move forward, we'll probably be left with more populations that are impacted disproportionately be, disproportionately by these health issues. Next. So this is where community engagement comes in. So when it is done well, it should support and enhance the ability to achieve data-driven results. For the purposes of this uh, presentation, we are gonna refer to community as the intended beneficiaries and their families, our neighbors, and trusted leaders, okay? And then it also includes, sorry, including these individuals can be an integral part of reaching positive health outcomes across the services that your organizations provide. Next slide. <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite cartoon characters. Um, pictures as it relates to community engagement. I want to state that it's important to be clear, direct, and transparent about your purpose for engaging the community. If you see engagement as something nice to do or just want to, you know, kind of check the community engagement box and get it done, your engagement will fail every time and likely lead to greater distrust, distrust and conflict with those that you are intended to serve. When doing community engagement, as it says on the slide, it is important to provide culturally appropriate information that can definitely help the community and others make informed decisions, which hopefully will reduce their health risk as it relates to any health issue. Next slide. We must recognize that our best efforts when, when guided by data and evidence will not succeed without com community members' experience, knowledge, relationships, skills, and participation. Meaningful engagement can take shape in a variety of ways, um, but it requires at all times to have devoted time and flexibility on our part as organizations or leaders in the community. It's important that we build trust and relationship, relationships with people and find a variety of ways to enable their connection to any of our projects, our processes, or any um, programs that we plan to roll out for our communities. So here I put on the slide just a few key principles in community engagement. That is ensuring that you work together. Again, you have transparency and trust. 
transparency hopefully will lead to that trust with the community that you do authentic outreach for informed decision making and again always be patient and flexible okay next slide so this is uh, what we call the community engagement spectrum this slide shows the increasing impact community engagement has on decision making and implementation as we go through each step on the spectrum please note that wherever you are it is important again to be clear and transparent about your position and fulfill any associated promises on uh, the next couple of slides i will go um, more detail for each step this can also i'm um, sorry go back i also want to kind of explain the spectrum so when you go from left to right it builds so inform is this kind of telling the community about things and each step it builds your engagement with the community and what that looks like and so when you get to the far right side that's where you are organizing people to identify their interests and assets and they become true decision makers outcome producers advocates and leaders so in community engagement it is about shifting power to the community so in order to move from left to right you have to be willing to give up some of your power and we'll talk a little bit about that next slide so starting at the left we were talking about inform this is just you know your typical we do a newsletter a fact sheet we might send out some public notices do a few social social media posts or we just have a website where we keep updated information and so when you are at this stage as an organization your promise to the community is we'll just keep you informed and the community stakeholders community members are there just to listen and understand at this step so you're just informing them about your programs or your services or organization as a whole you know just kind of keeping them up to date about what is going on next so when we consult a community this is when we invite their feedback right so the community feels as though they are contributing to the process this may look like surveys you know you might hold a couple of community meetings some community forums um, it, maybe even a few focus groups and each step has a process so a promise should I say and so this promise here is because I am consulting with you community I promise to keep you informed to listen to your input and feedback and then let you know that your ideas and concerns have somewhat influenced our decisions But when we involve the community, this is when you work with the community members to ensure their ideas and concerns are considered at every step of the decision making process. This is when you are engaging with them and their assets and you're asking them to be partners in your uh, implementing solutions. So this is really where we talk about community organizing. We may do ongoing workshops with the community. We may develop them as leaders, even maybe have formal engagements, right? And then your promise to them at this stage is we ensure that your input and feedback is directly reflective in any changes that we make. And we let you know ongoing that your information, your feedback influence our decisions and this is how. And you will continue to engage them as partners to implement those solutions next and then when we collaborate with the community this is again this is getting more involved right this is where we're building more trust and understanding with the community so now we're asking them to collaborate and be a part of every aspect of planning and decision making for new and i sh should put for new and old programs or services if you need to make a shift if you need to pivot are you just making that unilateral decision as an organization or have you involved community members who typically benefit from that program or service to say hey we need to you know being transparent we need to make a shift we need to pivot what are your ideas 
on how we do that. How do we plan for it? How do we inform others that we are doing it? And how do we make sure we don't lose any of you in the process? So um, possible ways to do that is including them on any advisory boards. If your organization has advisory boards, or if you have a governing board, do you have individuals on there that represent the community that you serve? Again, are they you know, participating in decision-making? And do you ask them as a community? Because they know, for the most part, what they want, what they need. Um, so do you ask them to come in and inform you all? You ask representatives from the community to inform your organization to say, hey, this, you, know, you all have been doing this program or providing this service for years. Times have changed just a little bit, and so have our community needs. Can we educate you all on what we as a community need? And then you all take that information again and work with them to co-create and co-produce solutions with you. That's kind of your promise at this, at this collaboration stage, is that, every, that the community, they will be true partners with your organization to identify and implement decisions for the community um, and take their advice as recommendations and to be incorporated as much as possible. And then lastly, at the far right, we had empower. This is when you are, this is when you are truly giving up, a, if not all of your part, power, part of your power, and transferring that to the community. You're allowing them to make decisions, have rule making, decision making authority over new programs or services, and you're giving them kind of full governance, full leadership, and full part partnership in that decision-making process and how things are rolling out. This is where you as an organization, as professionals, kind of step back a little bit and kind of um, you know, go into that supportive role for the community, and that's your promise to them, that you will be there as a supportive role while they move forward and roll out what they, what they as a community need with your assistance, of course. So that's kind of the spectrum broken down by each step. And so now I have a question for you. Based on the spectrum, where are your community engagement efforts now? Are you informing? Are you consulting? Are you involving, collaborating, empowering? Or, you know, in all honesty, are you not quite on the spectrum yet? And that's okay. So we're up to 60% voted. Okay. Waiting on a few more. We're at 70. We're up to 80 in less than a minute. Okay. And at a minute, we'll shut it off. Okay. So I see right now we have one that's not quite on the spectrum, which is fine. I see about... Let's see, half are in a consultant consultation mode with the community. We have responded at both, at um, all of them, sorry. So we have some that are informing, involving, collaborating. Okay, so we have in the organizations across the spectrum. That's great. So given where you are, my next question for you all is where do you aspire to be? And Sean, did you want to put that in the chat box? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if you could respond in the chat box, where do you aspire to be on the on the spectrum?
So in your engagement or interaction with the community, where do you aspire to be based on where you currently are on this on the spectrum? I see collaborative. Okay. I have a couple of collaborate. Okay. Everyone is they aspire to be at collaborate. So, uh, so I just wanted to comment on what Jim said. I, I, it flows right in line with collaborative, but I think the key thing is continuing to work with the community. Mm -hmm. So much of what's going on in the community right now, just the world as a whole, there are so many people that we work with saying we just want to be included. So mm -hmm. I love the fact, Jim, that you mentioned, mentioned continuing to work with the community. Good stuff. You took the words right out of my mouth, LaShawn. I was going to say that I, I think it is important that you are recognizing the need to continue to engage with the community and work with them hand in hand. Um, also, you know, within that, think of how you may be able to do that differently to potentially gauge additional community uh, members. And we'll go into that in the next few slides. Um, and so for those who were kind of at the inform and consult step in, in the spectrum, think of ways how you can build on, on that. And hopefully I'll be able to provide some ways um, as we move forward, but think of, you know, what could, what would be the benefit to community to build on that and how can you engage them to help you build to get to the involvement or collaboration or empowerment. I also, you know, want to note that it is not, I understand and I think we all understand that um, it's not always feasible <laughs> to collaborate and empower, but if you, inspire, if you aspire to have more engagement, then communicate that to the community. Let them know, you know, I know we only send out the newsletter, but we're looking, you know, we would love to in, engage you more. How would you like to see that? How would you like to be a part of that? That is engagement in itself. And then you have the community helping you move further towards the right end of the spectrum. And if you can't do it, you know, if, if you know, the way your organization is set up, or you know, based on the resources that you have, if you cannot engage them all the way to the empowerment side, explain that to them. Be transparent about how much you know power you are you can or are willing to give away or not, and explain why. Um, I think with, when it comes to community, they just want to know, not just no or I can't, but can you, you know, respect me enough to give me the why? Can you be transparent as to why? And if it's, you know, your internal processes or policies, then, you know, say that, say that's what it is. Um, but can we work with you maybe to look at our internal policies? How can we possibly change to ensure that we are engaging you at the level in which you want us to and based on our resources that we can, okay? So let's see, I'm reading Jim's um, chat. So you do roundtables in your business sectors and you engage and listen to the needs of the business community. That's great, Jim. Thank you for sharing. Problem, plus we do a lot of community engagement at all different levels. We have about 40, 40 relationships with nonprofits in our area that, you know, whether it's health, whether it's mental health, whether it's, uh, veterans, you name it, mm -hmm. uh, we have to be engaged and, uh, and that's what we do. And I think we do a pretty good job. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I'm sorry. What organization are you with? I am with Career Source Capital Region. Oh, okay. That is great. Thank you for sharing, Jim. Is there anyone else who just wants to, you know, unmute and openly, I don't want to kind of speak at you this whole time. I um, have a little discussion. Hopefully is anyone else Want to, does anyone else want to share kind of where you are currently with your community engagement?
So I had a question for Tamika, who's on the phone, I see. And Tamika works for Florida Voices, and a lot of it is capturing the voices of those who um, are definitely, definitely not treated well when it comes down to um, healthcare in the state of Florida. Tamika, I just wanted to know um, when you're working with clients and you're trying to get them to tell their story, how do you engage them? Because they're such vulnerable individuals, you may not be able to meet with them in person or even the community, but how do you engage them? So most of the people that we reach out to are referred, they reach out to us through our Facebook. We have a big campaign, um, social media, for people to share their story. So they reach out to us that way, or they're referred by somebody in the community, um, an Urban League, a UPHS, um, another nonprofit organization. And so the tone is set initially, you know, in the conversation when we first start, that we're collecting stories. And the reason we're collecting stories is because there's so many adults who don't have access to healthcare in Florida. And I think just being open to allowing them to share their story. And I, I tell them, you know, start wherever you'd like in your healthcare journey. And people go all the way back to when I was a little girl, or a little boy. Um, so I think setting the stage is really um, important. And as you mentioned, you know, we can't meet face to face really right now. So we do a lot of online engagement. Um, all of our, we're either by phone or we're doing a Zoom interview. Um, or we can do roundtable discussions, some with professionals, some with consumers or people who are living without access to healthcare. Um, so we, we start there, but definitely our goal is to move to a place where we can take some of those people who have told stories and move them along the engagement continuum. So initially they might tell their story, but does that, can that translate into a letter to the legislator or a letter to the editor or you know, just kind of seeing, doing an interview for a local newspaper or a national newspaper um, and engaging them in that way. And so we're trying to pull together a, almost a board, an advisory board. Um, so that's, that's why I say collaborate because we want them to influence the work that we do in terms of our advocacy. We can't do the advocacy without having their stories and their voices. So you were talking about forming an advisory board with those individuals? Okay. Right. 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 And part of that too, and the, the other piece of that has been this conversation around paying people um, for their expertise, because someone said to me recently, um, you know, if you have a conference online or in person, you pay the speakers mm -hmm. an honorarium uh, to share their expertise. And so there's this idea, you know, that when people do something, they, they don't get paid, but if they're expertise is their story and their experience, then we should pay them for that. So we're working on building a model to do that. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you for sharing. You're I welcome. look forward to seeing. Thank you, Lashana. <laughs> I look forward to seeing that, how that rolls out, especially with the formation of the board. Okay, thank you. I may have to call. Okay, them. it's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I look forward to it. No, I do want to point out, I think what you, what you said is, is important in terms of um, paying, you know, paying people for what their expertise and what they know. And of course, yes, they do. They are the expert of their own story. And I think a lot of um, organizations often forget that or not realize that, that, you know, while they may not have the PhD um, from the university on this topic, they have the PhD of life. And so if you're asking them to speak and share their story, as you do with others, it's, you know, that's equitable, right? right. We're paying everyone else. So I can't, you know, we pay you. We're just, you know, and at times it feels more when we do that um, to the community, then our engagement looks more transactional right. than actually authentic. Cause I'm, I'm treating, I'm not treating you as the same as others that I've asked to come speak to my group. And right. so, you know, Oh, or, you know, I may give you a meal in that, you know, but that's not the same. Those are, I'm not saying they won't appreciate the meal, <laughs> but when we talk about equity, especially in community engagement, that's, that's what we mean. So if I, I'm going to pay the PhD, you know, a hundred dollar honorarium. I could pay you a hundred dollar honorarium as well. Right. That, and that's the, the getting into that mindset mm -hmm. is especially, you know, having worked in social services for so long that you don't 
we don't we haven't thought about it in that way but it's very much um the case that is their um that is their that their experience is their life you want their life experience to drive what you do mm-hmm. um so you need to you have to respect that and i've seen that in as we talk about that kind of honorarium in that way um the empowerment i see the the consumer the person that i'm talking to there's a shift within them right because they then value they see that you value them for their experience and their expertise. Um, and it's not just, oh, I'm just going to give you a meal. Right. It is, you are valued here. And so they want to engage more. Right. And don't get me wrong for those on the line, the, the meal is, is nice. I'm not saying it's not. <laughs> but, um, you know, let's consider, you know, how we may be able to, to do more. Was there anyone else? I see Allison, you... Took yeah. yourself off mute. Did you want to chime in? I did. Um, so my my biggest problem right now is that everything is being done online. Mm-hmm. And we have, so what we do at, at um, Big Ben AHIC is, you know, we do tobacco cessation and, um, you know, b- basically basic health education. Mm-hmm. And we're just, we're having trouble with any kind of engagement right now. And it is starting to pick up. Mm-hmm. But I was just wondering if you had any thoughts surrounding that. So what what have you been doing? Um, so are you trying to engage them in meetings? Um, our, interviews? Well, meet, our you... classes um, uh-huh. is mostly what we're trying to get people to engage with us uh, for our, you know, our, our offerings, um, you know, to, because, we, you know, COVID right now mm-hmm. is completely connected. Um, to you know if you smoke you're more likely to have so you know so right. there's there's a need and there's a disconnect too between primary care now mm-hmm. um so yeah so are those engagements you know, what, during the day are they in the evening you're, we have you're them all times okay. all times and we that, that's the, you know that's one of our premises is just you know tell us when and where and we'll be there mm-hmm. um but we can't do that now because of social distancing. So it has to be when and where on the computer. Yes. <laughs> so um, have you, re- have you uh, reached out and asked, you know, kind of, hey, we haven't seen you. We've had these offerings. Um, you know, is, is the time not good? Is the, well, you can't do place because it's- For under- people that, <laughs> yeah, for people that do have signed up for the services, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we, you know, say, hey, yeah, is there a different time? How can we help you? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's just been really, really difficult. Yeah, I heard, I'm, I've heard that um, and experienced it myself. Um, most people think, you know, because it's virtual, people are more likely to attend. But I feel like with us all, we are probably zoomed out at this point um, mm-hmm. of, you know, going, I swear, since we've been um, working, since COVID and working virtual, like, I feel like I'm in more meetings and everything than I was before because, you know, people feel like you just hop on Zoom and talk with it's like, if you do that throughout the day, that's 10 hours of my day that are gone <laughs> mm-hmm. because, you know, it was easy to, to Zoom. Um, but I think, so it sounds like it's those individuals that you can't get to the Zoom um, in trying to find out the why. Um, so of those that come, do you ask them to maybe bring a friend or someone that yes. they know? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It, um, you know, we're in phase three now, right? So you can potentially have a small in-person. I don't know if what, if your organization is allowing it, uh, but you could potentially have a small um, face-to-face engagement where you try to invite those who aren't typically coming to the Zooms to see if that, if they're willing to do a small intimate yeah, um, we've we've actually offered that as well. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just a tough road. So you know, I'm 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 glad it's it's helpful for me to hear an expert like you say, "Have you tried this? Have you tried mm-hmm. this?" And I'm able to say, "Well, yes, mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> yes." So that's good. But yeah. Um, so then it's not you. So don't take it personal. <laughs> but, I am sorry. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, what am I doing wrong? No, I don't know that you're doing anything wrong. I do, you know, it's just the space in which we in which we are currently in. But I think 
if you can lay, you know, I say people, if you could close your eyes and know that you've done your due diligence and trying to get in trying to engage, then you've done your part. You, you've done your engagement in trying to engage. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't say that you, you know, I don't know that there's much more you could do other than be consistent with the attempts to engage and maybe, you know, not to harass, but <laughs> um, the frequency in which you engage. So those individuals, you know, at some point will say, okay, you know what, I, I probably just need to check this out and, and log on and, and see what Allison and her group has to say. No, it's a, it's a problem for all of us, I think. Mm -hmm. We're we're down 80% uh, number of people contacting us, even though you know the unemployment is really mm -hmm. high. And there's plenty of jobs, frankly. We're getting job postings every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, uh, it's just people are reluctant. But we also, one thing to keep in mind that I think the data is starting to show us right now is we've lost about 10,000 people in the job market mm -hmm. that are still here and still living here, but are not working and not looking for mm -hmm. work. And uh, part of that's because of the waiver by the governor, which will end December 7th or 8th right. or somewhere. Once that happens, we figure we'll just be overwhelmed, but we don't know. Sure. You know, at this point, it's uh, it's puzzling to say the least. It, it has been interesting to see um, what has taken place uh, because of COVID in the, in the uh, employment world and economics and you know you make a good point that there may be a rad um rad mad rush in december as you know the governors <laughs> um as that starts to sunset and so you may get a mad rush or you know they may not come till january because uh, you know december is holiday time so they may want to wait but um i do think um it will pick up it 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 definitely will and at that time then you know it's kind of so how do you engage those individuals and you know um, help them or ask them to help you and ensuring that the services that you provide are meeting the mark for them yeah, it's okay. just it's scary for us at this point because mm -hmm. we've got no extra money from right. any of the funding streams and we've got people on SNAP that we handle, people on welfare that we handle, and people that are looking for jobs under uh, our REOA law. And they're all just sort of, you know, we're, we're appointment only, so we are seeing people on a regular basis. But as I said, it's a very small number. And if it all comes at one time, my staff's worried about their safety and they're worried about how we're even gonna handle it. So. Uh, that's one thing that we continue to consider at this point. Yeah, and I would definitely, I was just going to say that, I would definitely plan for that. Um, and plan for, let's be honest, as you know, we continue to move into 2021, we, we don't know what our organizational resources are going to look like because of how much has been put into COVID and will continue to be uh, put into COVID. So, you know, having a, a brainstorming session with your organization, with your staff and community on, you know, what if, what if our resources are either maintained or reduced as a result of everything, of COVID and everything else that's going on. So then, you know, if, again, if we have to pivot and identify maybe prioritizing our services and our programs, so what would that look like, you know? And that's another way you can engage the community in your plan, in your organizational planning is to say, you know, we, hey, we just, we're not saying this is gonna happen, but we wanna have a plan in place if it does. And we do, you know, and, would you you know, we've added to our technology like we've never, we spent over mm -hmm. 100,000 in new technology. So you can reach us on your phone, you can mm -hmm. do almost everything by yourself without us having to engage directly with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do need that engagement, uh, just like Allison, we're using Zoom and we're using, uh, you know, one-on-one -on, -one on the phone, mm -hmm. whatever we can do to help, we're there. Sounds great. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. Um, Shonda, we can go to the next slide. So when we talk about community uh, engagement, we tap into what is called asset-based community development. Has anyone heard of this before? You could just respond yes. in the chat if you have or have not. Yes. Yes, you have. Okay. Anyone else? I know Jim has. Is anybody else? Okay. Awesome. So for those who may not know what this term is, it 
So what it means is instead of defining people and communities by their deficits, as an organization, we find and use their assets. Their assets being their experience, their knowledge, their skills, talents, passions, and even their relationships. And use their assets as a means to engage them. So um, it is a place-based strategy that recognizes that people don't always need programs and institutions to serve them and often can achieve more when working in partnership or together with the organizations, their neighbors and their families in their community to help solve problems and strengthen their communities, right? So that's really what asset-based community development is, is looking at the assets of the community and building on those to help the community, to benefit the community. So you're working with them to build on their assets that they already have. Because like I said, it's not, it's, it, they may not need a program or, you know, um, all services from an organization. If we look at their assets first and where they want to go as a community, as a people, then we can shape our programs accordingly and work with them to build that. So in that, you're solving the community's problems, not just um, building on your programs, okay? So I just kind of um, think it's about five questions that you can ask yourself as an organization when you're thinking of the asset-based community development. So what can residents best do by themselves? What do they need <clears throat> some help from your organization to do? What does your organization do best? What can we stop doing because people can do it by themselves? And then what can we offer um, to the community to support their assets? So those are kind of the five questions you can ask yourself when you're thinking of engaging with the community. Do you have a handout with those questions? I yes, I can I provide it. Yeah, I can provide it to LaShawn. Okay. And actually, um, I'll try to put them in the chat too towards the end. Okay, those were really good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, next slide, please. So um, up on the screen, on the picture, you have, you know, one glass is what we need. And then the other is what does the community already have or what do we already have? Okay, so the distinction here is seeing community members not as just resources of input or feedback, but as part of the outcome that you are looking for for your organization to have with the communities that, you're, that you serve, okay? Um, most nonprofits and even governmental services, we think of uh, kind of, you know, what, what do we think the community needs and to solve their problems, but we need to look at those individuals in the community in their neighborhoods and the issues being served as um, their assets that we need to have at the table. So the goal should be not to have strong programs, but strong communities, right? Because that's the only change that is sustainable is when we have our strong communities. Next slide. So here's a quote um, from a representative from the William Casper Memorial Fund. If we commit to engaging community members, we have set them up for success. We have to orient them to our world and engage in theirs. So the next couple of slides, I'll talk a little bit about this, break it down a little bit. <clears throat> so when I say communicate, okay, be clear that community, uh, sorry, community members and grassroots leaders are assets to your initiative, okay, or your program or your service, who you need to achieve better results, right? It's important that everyone at the table share and commit to this view. It is important when you are engaged in the community that the members understand their value and their roles and they are not tokenized, okay? So that's the, the communicate part. It is important that you meet them where they are. Identify ways to accommodate them and make it easier to participate. Allison and Jim, you know, talked on that when you, and even, um, is it Tamika or did I say that right? It's Tamika, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, 
um, you know, when you three talked about you, you, you're trying to meet them where they are, right? Um, exactly. Unfortunately, you know, we're doing virtual right now, but we are, you know, opening our Zoom up, you know, to the evening times or, or whatever to better meet you where you are. Next, Shonda. Orient and prepare. So um, this is orienting the community members to what you are as an organization, what your decision making process is, maybe even why some decisions have been made to date. You know, just make it clear on what the decisions and what the process, decision making process will look like. You can, at this point, you know, review data, any data that you use to make a decision. So you're orienting the community to your processes, your decision-making process, and any other relevant information about your organization and the decisions that have been made, and you're preparing them, okay, to work with you in addressing those. So you're orienting, orienting them and preparing them. And then acknowledge power differentials. Again, Communication and transparency is important here. Um, every, everyone at the table should understand what everyone's goal is. And hopefully you all can work together to you know, get to a common goal. But it's important that you acknowledge, I am the organization, but we are here to work with you. So this point forward, there are no power differentials. We are the same. We are coming together to collaborate and identify solutions. Okay. So you're acknowledging the power differentials, but you're not allowing those power differentials to direct the communication or the conversation or the engagement. Next. Of course, be inclusive, right? Um, don't, and when we talk about being inclusive, this also can link to the orient and prepare right and prepare um, step in that you are being inclusive and you're using wording that everyone should know. So you're not, you know, using acronyms when you're first engaging the community, you're spelling everything out. And, you know, you are just talking to ensure that everyone is engaged. They understand the intent or the expectation of the process of the engagement, why they are there. And um, hopefully that will help build the trust because everyone's being transparent and then it allows everyone to get on the same page. So that's what um, we mean when we talk about being inclusive. And my favorite one that most don't like is allow steam to blow. Let's just be honest, especially when engaging a community, if your organization, you know, maybe only informed up to this point, or if, you know, you finally get community to the table and they've had bad experiences. Allow them to blow off that steam in the beginning. Allow them to say what, you know, they had, I had a bad experience two years ago and, you know, you all didn't do anything and now you're asking me to be at this table. Allow that conversation. Um, don't allow it to be a completely negative conversation. So really structure it um, to allow them to blow off steam. but have a plan to move past that. And I'm not saying, you know, if it's a one hour meeting, I'm not saying give them a whole hour to blow off steam, but maybe 15 minutes and, and say that up front. Say, you know, we brought you together because, you know, we really want your input. We want to engage you and want you to be part of the process. We understand, you know, you may not have felt part of the process previously. We're going to use the first 10 to 15 minutes to talk about that. Or, you know, do you have issues that you want to bring up? allow them to get rid of that steam because that's the only way you all would be able to move forward okay because if people are stuck in their anger in their grievances you won't be able to move forward towards a positive result so just create the space for them to be able to blow off that speed steam respect that steam and hopefully you can move past that and move on to better things so and I wanted to say something real quick, um, Brandy, in regards to um, being inclusive. I think as, as leaders, as professionals, I think when we think of inclusive, um, we forget about 
that's not just sexuality. That's just mm -hmm. not social economic status. That really, really is uh, being willing to allow someone else to add, to pull up a seat to the table. And so mm -hmm. I think that's also making sure that everybody that needs to be at the table in the room is invited. So I think with inclusive, we need to always make sure we're taking a deep dive and a closer look at that. Yeah, that is a good point. And also, you know, and, and again, it's not even just having the seat at the table. Well, once they're at the same table, are they eating from the same plate? Or are they, are they eating the same food? Like, do they really understand what it means to be at the table? So that's the other part of being inclusive is just making sure everyone understands where you are as an organization, where they are as a participant, and so that everyone is kind of starting from the same point. And if I could add to that, um, this is Tamika. Um, I think part of it too is some acknowledgement as a leader to yourself and to your team that you may not always know right. who needs to be at the mm -hmm. table. And so being able to be humble enough and say, okay, who do we need to ask? Or let me ask someone else because I don't want to leave anybody out. And especially if it's, an, it's a group that you're not a mm -hmm. part of, you may have no clue. Like you don't know what you don't know. So having trusted advisors, you know, around you that can point to, oh, well, you know, here's this group needs to be included. It, it may be a group that you never would have even considered because mm -hmm. they're not on your radar yeah. and in your circle. Mm -hmm. Good point. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. I think I just have one more polling slide. What capacities will be necessary to implement community engagement in your organization? So for instance, do you need resources? Do you need the time? You, you can put it in the chat. Um, do you need the time? You know, do you need staff time? Do you need staff training? So if you could just, you know, put in the chat on what you think you may need to build capacity in your organization to implement community engagement or to improve your community engagement efforts. Do you need organizational culture change? Do you need training of staff, volunteers? Do you think you need um, professional support partnerships? Okay. All right. So um, I think Tamika and I may have been thinking the same thing. Um, I think that agencies really need to look at, even if it's just carving out a small budget, funding mm -hmm. resources is needed for community engagement. Because I think the community is a big part of what we do, but a lot of times it's kind of a second thought, right? Well, mm -hmm. you you gonna have to make it work. But if we said, you know, this is set aside and so, oh, okay, we got a little budget, we can kind of get creative and do some different things. So I do mm -hmm. think, Funding is super important. Okay. Is that um, a realistic to be able to set aside, you know, a small pot of funds? I don't know everyone's funding levels and stuff, so I just, I don't, just asking how realistic that may be for organizations to be able to do. I know with one of the member agencies that we're working with right now. They don't currently have the budget, but moving mm -hmm. forward, it's definitely one of those things in their strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So, okay, even if we don't have it this year, next year, the goal is going to be that we're going to get some unrestricted funds so we can do more in the area of our community engagement. Okay. That's good. All right, I see increased board diversity. We need several people who can be trained for outreach and engagement. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so here's a, here's a question. So I see it says um, a couple people said they needed training or and or staff to be trained on outreach and engagement. Have um, you all considered, you know, of you know those that you serve, asking them to come and speak to your staff on how to engage them? You can either write in the chat or unmute yourself. Yes, we have our partners come and uh, make presentations to our staff. Um, TCC, for example, or CCYS or other partners in the community so that staff is aware of what services they offer. And we do that probably once every couple of months, bring somebody in. Okay. Uh, Capillary Community Action was the last one that did a presentation to our staff. So yes, we try and keep them up to date on where the resources are. Okay. Anyone else? Have you thought of asking those a member um, or several individuals that your organization currently serves to possibly come in and you know talk about how to engage with them, with the community? Okay. It's okay if you haven't. It's just, you know, it, it's a thought as well. Um, kind of going back to what Tamika and I were talking about earlier and, um, you know, that whole honorarium and, and paying them. But also if you're served, you know, to get feedback from those that you serve, how would you like us to engage with you? Um, you know, is, is, you know, is, are you all willing to be here on Saturdays at 8 a.m.? I don't know. So that's, it's just a thought. And, um, Ooh, 1054. So those, that was uh, kind of my uh, spiel for today. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments? If not, here's my contact information as well, if you don't have any questions or comments now. Brandy, I'm just, I'm still thinking about um, the, the, the last question that you asked mm -hmm. and ways to take, to have consumers come in and share with you our clients, share with you what their needs are or ways that you can provide outreach to them. Do you have any suggestions on ways to do that? Especially, I guess, I guess in COVID, like, mm -hmm. could you, would you put like, a, would you pull together like a round table, like on the first Wednesday of every month at six o'clock yep. and whoever wanted to come and participate, come and then you have just some questions on well, where can we provide the information? Where, where should we be, mm -hmm. right? You know where we are, but where should we be right. providing outreach to people? Okay. Exactly, and then you can, and in your explaining of where you are, you could say, why, you know, why are you there? You know, is it based on data? Is it, you know, you heard from, you know, kind of qualitative stuff, kind of, you know, heard from individuals in the community, this is where we should be, you know, and then say, you know, are we in the right place? Like you said, are there other places that we should be? Okay. So again, that's that transparent and explaining of why you currently do what you do and that you're interested in seeing if there's other ways to do what you do. Anyone else? Well, <laughs> well, Brandy's contact information is on the screen and definitely um, if anyone wants to get in contact with her, I have the PowerPoint. You can send me an email or even get her to, you know, just kind of sit down and do a, a think tank session with you. I know she's open to do that. Um, we'll have it uploaded on our YouTube channel as well as Facebook. And so you can also check it there. But thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Um, we all are continuing to do the great work in this community as we work hard to serve our clients. So you all have a great rest of the week. And please let us know if you need anything. Okay, thank and you. I, and I put the five questions in the chat box. I think someone asked me about the five questions I had said. Uh, put those in the chat box. I copied it. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> no Excellent, problem. Brandy, thank you. Very thank helpful. you. Have thank a good you. Day. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye.